Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Andy Yoon, and I'm so excited to be presenting to you for SQL Bits 2020. And today, I'm going to be presenting Can SQL Server 2019 Auto Magically Fix My Bad T SQL Code? So first of all, just a little bit of biographical information about me. Most of this is not really all that important. Really just take away the fact that I've been working with SQL Server for quite a while. And also note my contact information. I'm very active on Twitter and I love helping people out answering questions, whether it be online or via email or whatever the case may be. There's so many people in this great community that have given back to me over the years and I love giving back as well. So please never hesitate to reach out. I love to talk shop. Also, please note my GitHub address down at the bottom. This is where you'll find repositories of all of my different presentations and all the uh, subsequent files and demo code, including everything for today. So let's get started. So please think about your T-SQL applications right now. Anyone here happen to have an application that meet any of this criteria? Or, you know, I'd like to think that we all have at least one application that fits at least some of these different criteria and or we've been stuck with one of these in the past. Um, and frankly, does the performance of any of these applications make you sad? I don't know about you, but I've been stuck with quite a few legacy applications over the years and they've caused me numerous different headaches because we're trapped by the code, we really can't make changes to them or whatever the case may be. So wouldn't it be nice if Microsoft gave us an easy button to automatically magically fix that T-SQL code and improve performance without having to change the underlying code in of itself? Because we all know that refactoring applications, changing T-SQL code brings a lot of risk and it's a lot of work to do. So again, wouldn't it be really cool if, if Microsoft could do something in the engine? Well, Unfortunately, a true easy button to magically fix all bad T-SQL code really isn't possible for a number of different reasons. Things like workload and how data changes over time. However, Microsoft has made huge strides to make things better for us over the years. So that brings us to the next question. What version of SQL Server is that legacy application of yours running on? Because they're legacy apps, many of us are running on you know, 2012 or even earlier. Maybe some of us are still stuck on 2008 or even 2005. Well, even if you think you're permanently tied to that old version of SQL Server, I would encourage you to try and test it out on a newer version of SQL Server, preferably SQL Server 2019, and just see what happens. Because for all you know, it may still magically improve things, and I'll talk about uh, why that's the case. Because the thing is, Microsoft has made uh, incremental improvements over the years. And let's take a quick little bit of history of query processing. In SQL Server 2014, Microsoft gave us the brand new Cardinality Estimator. Prior to 2014, that had not changed since SQL Server 7.0. And the Cardinality Estimator plays a huge role to help better predict the total number of records that are returned by a query. And the Cardinality Estimator you know, ensures or improves the quality of the execution plans that are generated by the query processor. And then in SQL Server 2016, one of the major improvements that Microsoft gave us was something called the Query Store. And the Query Store persists history of our query executions and their subsequent performance. So now we have data, and with that data, we can analyze the past and make predictive, proactive decisions about how to potentially change things. And then in SQL Server 2017, Microsoft gave us something really cool called Adaptive Query Processing. And it changed a key fundamental rule about the behavior of our execution plans. So to better understand that, let's take a quick look at the overview of the query lifecycle to understand this behavior. So you start with the T-SQL query, and we pass it into the query optimizer. And it's the job of the query optimizer to come up with an execution plan. And that execution plan is what's going to tell the storage engine what to do. I want to do an index seek. I want to do some nested loop joins here, so on and so forth. And then once the query optimizer is done creating that execution plan, it is then passed off to the storage engine for execution. Now, the key fundamental rule that I was talking about earlier 
is that once an execution plan is created, it is essentially set in stone. We cannot go back and change it after executing in the storage engine. The storage engine can't say, oh, we made some bad decisions in this execution plan. I want to make some adjustments until adaptive query processing came along, which now allows us to either make decisions on the fly through things like adaptive joins or make changes at least for subsequent executions through things like memory grant feedback. So these are some really cool features that were introduced in 2017. However, there's a bit of a problem with this, or I should say a limitation. The thing is, those two key capabilities of adaptive query processing were tied to batch mode. And batch mode was only available for column store constructs. And the thing is, most of our legacy applications existed before column, uh, column store was even a thing. So because of that, there's not a lot of, you know, not a lot of our legacy applications that can really leverage the new adaptive query processing that was introduced in SQL Server 2017. So sad face, unfortunately. Thankfully, in SQL Server 2019, Microsoft took adaptive query processing to the next level. Now we have intelligent query processing. And with intelligent query processing, it is now available to the masses, if you will. The capability or functionality that I want to focus on today is something called table variable deferred compilation. And if you know me, I'm not a big fan of table variables. So I'm happy to see that Microsoft has made some changes to that particular behavior. Some of the other uh, capabilities inside intelligent query processing include inlining of scalar user to find functions and now batch mode for row store. And because we now have batch mode for row store, adaptive joins are now available to our legacy code base. And then memory grant feedback was also introduced for row store constructs. So I'm not going to talk about those others, but those are things you may want to look into because those are other cool things that can help auto magically fix your T-SQL code without changing, a line of, uh, without changing a line of code. But again, for today's purposes, let's just talk about table variable deferred compilation. So here we go. So as I said before, I've never actually really liked table variables very much. They have a lot of different drawbacks. But first, let's understand you know, where they came from. First of all, we have variables and we have tables. A variable, fundamentally, is just a construct that is not persisted that stores one single value, whereas a table is a construct that is persisted. And it's one that can store many different values. Pretty simple and straightforward, right? So what happens when you mash them together? We get something called a table variable. It is a new construct that is not persisted like a variable, but like a table, it can store many different values. This sounds like it could be very cool and can be very, very useful. And that's what a lot of people thought when Microsoft first brought table variables uh, into play and introduced them into uh, SQL Server. But the thing is, though, there's a big drawback when it comes to the query optimizer. One of the jobs of the query optimizer is to come up with a good execution plan for us. And in order to do that, it must figure out how many values are inside each of the different constructs that we are querying and working with, whether they be variables, tables, or table variables. So in the context of a variable, the query optimizer only thinks that there's ever one value inside of a variable, because there can only ever be one value inside of a variable. When it comes to a traditional table, we have underlying statistics. And the query optimizer will leverage those statistics to come up with estimates as far as how many values it believes are inside that particular table, and how many of the subset of those values actually meet the criteria of our query, if we have predicates or whatever. However, in the case of a table variable, SQL Server and the query optimizer still thinks there's only one value inside. Now, thankfully, in SQL Server 2019, we made uh, uh, Microsoft made some additional changes to help you uh, help the query optimizer think that there's at least more than one single value, but it's still a ridiculously low number of 100. So that doesn't really help us. So why do estimates really matter? Well. I love analogies, so let's use a quick analogy to kind of break this down. So, oh hey, Andy, can you move this little box for me? Yeah, sure, that's a small little box, that's no big deal. I'm sure it's really light and, and there's not much inside of it, right? On the other hand, when I start trying to pick up that box, 
I wind up finding out that, oh, this box is a heck of a lot heavier than I expected. I did not anticipate this properly. And instead of being able to lift and move this box for you, I wind up hurting my back. And I'm in a lot of pain and anguish as a result because I misestimated the weight of this box. So much in the same way that SQL Server does that, SQL Server 2019 now gives us table variable deferred compilation, which now helps us better anticipate how many values are inside that table variable. So what SQL Server now does is that it waits until the very first execution of the corresponding statement that leverages that table variable to then peek inside that table variable and give us the actual cardinality. How many values are actually inside this table variable? Or going along back to that analogy, you've given me that simple task, but instead of just outright lifting it or just taking a guess as to what's inside, I'm gonna take a peek inside this box. And then I'm gonna see that, oh wow, I don't know how you fit all this stuff in this box, but this box is really heavy because there's a lot of stuff in here. So now that I know, when I actually execute by moving this box, I'll know I need to use a uh, uh, use a tool or get some help in order to actually lift this box. I'm now no longer going to be surprised because I now have a better idea of everything inside that box. So hopefully you have a good understanding of that. So why don't we now see all of this in action in demo? All right, let's start off with our auto dealership demo database, which is uh, the demo database that I like to use for all my different presentations, of course, available up on my GitHub. First of all, I want to point out that Microsoft has introduced something called database scope configurations. This is what's going to allow you to control all of the new different capabilities, the feature by feature on, a, on all your new databases inside SQL Server 2019 please use this going forward. This is something that's extremely powerful. We don't have to rely on trace flags anymore to control these things on a, on a server-wide basis. I can now control it on a specific database by database basis. So if you find a certain combination of, say, intelligent query processing capabilities work well for one application, but not necessarily for another, you can absolutely mix and match. So I'm going to use this little piece of code here to just show you what's inside this new DMV sys uh, database scope configurations. And and now we're going to see the current setting for deferred compilation that we're going to be making use of. So I've already turned it off. This is the command to turn it off right here. So first of all, I'm going to do a quick little bit of setup here. And what I'm doing is I'm going to create two different temp tables, one with customer records and another with sales history records. First, I'm only going to insert one customer into my customer table, and then I'm going to insert half a million into the sales history table. Um, and then we're going to populate the sales history table with all of the sales history records that pertain to that particular customer. And then we'll create a couple of indexes on it to make sure that these temporary tables are even optimized for our example here. So I'm just going to create this uh, real fast. We've finished that out now. So first of all, let's do a little bit of a baseline here. So um, I'm just going to do a simple join between these two tables. Uh, and remember, they're solid. Uh, they're, they're tables. They've been indexed. Um, I, have, I am forcing a serial plan in this particular example, but that's neither here nor there. It's just helpful for the context of this example. And first of all, let's look at the execution plan. I'm going to zoom in here. And we see that against uh, sales history, we've done an index seek, and we've done a full uh, table scan of the t uh, of the customer table. However, we're only going after one record, so <laughs> it's just scanning one thing here, right? And as a result, we happen to have a nested loop join. Keep in mind that a nested loop join excels when you have one data set that's very small, like the customer table, and another data set that's very large, like the sales history table. And my subsequent I/O from logical reads here from set statistics IO, six logical reads, two logical reads, so eight total logical reads, very, very small and lightweight. And my execution time was trivial, very, very small. And by the way, my query cost as well, if I were to dive into this, was also very, very small, uh, zero, uh, 0.0127, so quite, quite a small value. 
So we already took a look at this. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a customer table variable. And I'm going to insert that same customer ID that's inside the temporary table into that table variable. And then we're going to do a compare and contrast of that join construct that we did a moment ago. One's going to be against a table variable, and the other will be against a temp table for compare and contrast purposes. But I do have to execute all of this. OK, that's done. So if we look at the execution plan, we see for this table variable here, once again, my estimate of one out of you know one record, that's accurate because there's only one value inside the customer table variable. And we once again happen to have a nested loop operation here. OK, and if I look at the underlying IO, uh, three logic, oh wait, no, that's to insert in. So we have uh, two logical reads here and then another six logical reads here. So a total of eight logical reads, which is identical to the baseline as well. And execution time is also quite trivial as well. So not a problem. And this is the ideal situation for a table variable. But the benefit of a table variable though is to be able to store more than one value. So let's see that in play. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an adjustment first to the temporary table for customers and insert half a million records. And then once I've done that, let's rerun our comparison test. This is the same construct as before. Uh, so I'm going to you know, insert all of those same uh, customer IDs into the table variable. So now we have half a million against half a million. And this is taking a little bit longer now. So we see that the overall elapsed time is uh, 1,926 milliseconds for the table variable example. However, for the temp table version of it, just uh, uh, it's a little bit faster, 1,176. So that's actually a marked improvement. Think in terms of percentages. That's a huge percentage difference. And then if I look at the I.O., 1,076 logical reads plus... Ooh, this is a ridiculously large number, 1.5 million logical reads. If I come down to the temp table variation of it, zeros over here, about 1,800, about 1,900 logical reads all said and done. So a fraction of the I.O. Let's take a look at the execution plan to understand why. In the case of the table variable, half a million of one. My estimate inside the customer table variable was just one record. And as a result, we still decided to go with a nested loop join, which was completely awful in this scenario of half a million against a very large number of uh, sales history records. So that's one reason why my estimates got completely blown out of the water. And as a result, we wound up having a whole bunch of headaches. In contrast, let's look at the temp table, which in this case used a hash match join here because we happen to have two large data sets. And this is an example where uh, this executed heck of a lot faster and more efficiently because we were able to take a look inside. Now, let's turn on deferred compilation and let's rerun our comparison here. So let's just glance at the execution plan. And the execution plan has some good news for us. Half a million of half a million. This is fantastic. Yay, we're happy to see this uh, this now. Because we've now looked inside the table variable, we determined, oh, there's a half a million records in here. And we wound up choosing a merge join. Because remember, I indexed all of these values ahead of time. So because of that, SQL Server chooses a merge join. And this is a good thing. We vastly improved the performance of this piece of code. And let's look at the execution times to further prove that. So in this case, about uh, 2,100 milliseconds. So yes, it is a little bit higher. But on the other hand, 1,700 milliseconds for the temp table. So the percentage differential is actually much more narrow now. It's not as wide of a percentage difference. Yeah, in this particular context, there is going to be some variation here. But think of the percentage differences. That's really the key takeaway that I want you to all to focus in on. And then if we look at the underlying I.O., 
Well, we still did a heck of a lot of I.O. here, but it's not 1.5 million. It's about 1.1 million. Now, granted, there is a higher volume of data, but this is still a little bit better without, again, changing a line of code. So you might think that this is really cool. But one of the key differences with table variables and temp tables is this. We don't have column stats on the table variables. So all we know is the number of values inside it, but we don't know the data distribution. So we can't necessarily narrow things down. We can't do range scans or anything like that. We must still consume all half million records or whatever inside of that. So on the other half, what I also want to do very quickly is show you one of the drawbacks. And this was inspired by an article by Brent Ozar. Thank you very much. And this is one of the pitfalls. So I happen to have a store procedure here called customer table variable count uh, is equal to three. And then we're just going to do the same kind of construct earlier where I'm just going to be grabbing three different uh, customer values and then doing the table variable join. And then I'm also going to add in a uh, covering index as well. So let's execute that real fast. I'm going to turn off uh, deferred compilation. And I'm going to prove that it's off by using that diagnostic query. And then I'm also going to turn on actual execution plan. And we're going to execute this store procedure twice, first with the count of three, and then a count with, uh, with a count of 300,000. And then you see in the execution plans that for the first execution, I have a nested loop join. And my estimate is three of one. That's not too bad. However, if I look at the second one, I see that I have a nested loop join once again, and I have 300,000 of one. Again, a bad estimate. Let's turn on deferred compilation, and let's rerun this example. And interestingly enough, if I look inside here, we have that nested loop join again. We have five, you know, uh, is our estimate for the table variable. That's good. We peaked inside. However, it's the subsequent execution that gets us into trouble. We have a nested loop join again because our previous estimate of five has stuck because of parameter sniffing. And that's the one major drawback. We only do the deferred compilation for the very first execution. So if your table variable is uh, such that the, the volume of data varies widely, then you're going to be in big trouble. All right, so with that, I'd like to leave you with some parting thoughts. Definitely, you need to be cautious because parameter sniffing and caching issues can still burn you. But I want to encourage you to not be afraid. Test, test, and test, of course. Don't dive blindly into this. But remember that SQL Server is all about trade-offs. You're going to get some benefit, but there's going to be a small price to pay. So you know, always make sure that you're testing things. But hey, if I can still improve my T-SQL performance for my legacy applications by even 10 or 15% without changing a line of code, just by upgrading to a new version of SQL Server, that can be a huge, huge, huge benefit in the grand scheme of things. And remember, make use of database scope configurations to turn on, on and off all of the different new features and capabilities within Intelligent Query Processing to make sure that you have the right combination that works for your application that does not cause you any uh, uh, you know, unforeseen regressions. All right, so with that, Thank you so much. If you happen to have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Otherwise, here's my GitHub, here's my contact information, and once again, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you've uh, had a great SQL Bits, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, talk again soon. Bye-bye.